Hi, welcome to City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. Your Honor, welcome. Hey, Walt, good to see you. We have a, a lot going on now. We have uh, the federal elections. Uh, we've got a lot of implications from the COVID and we've got Halloween, a lot of projects going on in the city. Maybe we'll start off uh, talking about early voting, which has already started in, in Beverly. Maybe you can give us some details on that, Mike. Absolutely. Thanks, Walt. So, um, you know, we're, as, we, as we tape this on Monday, um, early voting started this past Saturday on, on October 17th, and it'll run right through uh, October 30th, which is a, a week from Friday. So it'll run every day, including Saturday and Sunday. Anybody who wants to vote early can come down and vote on the first floor of City Hall Monday through Friday during our regular hours that we're open, and that's all on the city website. Uh, on the weekend, the voting is, let me just check my notes, the voting is from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. both Saturday and Sunday. So that'll be this coming weekend. Uh, and as I said, it's all this week through the weekend and all next week through uh, Friday the 30th. Um, and we know, I mean, the lines have been have been moving. They've been good good size, but moving all day. People are getting through pretty quickly and, and, and efficiently. Um, what we've done at the, on the first floor of City Hall, and I say we, the, the city clerk's office is in charge of the elections, but working together, they set up a system whereby you come in the front door and go out the back door. It's only one way flow. There are only a handful of, of uh, voting stations set up along the course of the first floor. So only a few people at a time are in the building um, and people come in, you, 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 you must wear a face covering. You come in the front door, get checked in like you would at a regular polling place. And you go, you get your ballot, you go, um, you know, fill it out and you, you submit it before you leave on the, by the back door. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're excited about how it's going. And, and we know a lot of people are, are you know, anxious to take advantage of it. And uh, I'd encourage people to come down at any time that we're open in order to do that or during the course of the day this weekend. Yeah. Now, uh, what, what kind of a turnout have we been getting, Mike? Are, are, there, are there lines forming? Are people having to wait in line? Well, I mean, I just came in from a, I was doing a meeting at one of the picnic tables and the flow was steady. The line looked like it was kind of anywhere from uh, three or four people to eight to 10 people at any given time. Um, wasn't, you know, particularly long, which is good, but it was steady. I think what people are probably finding is if they, if they come in and, you know, at the beginning of the day, there might be a line queued up when, when the doors open. Uh, and, and that's fine. People, you know, vote and get on with their day. Uh, but it has just been pretty consistent throughout. Uh, and, and of course, we're doing a good job of distancing people and it's from, you know, from the front door out to the sidewalk, along the sidewalk on Cabot and then down Thorndike if need be. Uh, but as I said, it hasn't, the line hasn't gotten that long. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I think it's going very well. And as I said, the, the poll workers are doing a great job of moving people through, um, you know, with good efficiency. I will say, well, now that, let's talk about, so, let, let me just finish off that by saying, because of COVID and the fact that we need to keep people distanced from each other and in their own kind of their own space, we're not able to have the public come into city hall for anything other than voting during this time, this week and next week. We did have city hall open for the last several weeks prior to that. So what we're doing instead of that is we've set up the help desk outside at one of the picnic tables. Anybody who has a question for other than voting purposes can come to the help desk. We do have people working in the various offices at City Hall. We can have somebody get on the phone with or come out and meet with somebody with a question for another department. Now we'll do that every day this week and next week unless the weather gets really bad. If the weather's particularly bad, we won't try to do that. But we're going to do it as much as we can over, over this week and next week. Now, uh, if people uh, don't want to take advantage of early voting and want to wait till election day, they would, they would proceed just like they normally do, go to the regular polling places. What, what kind of safety precautions because of the COVID uh, has, is the city taking for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, my understanding is, um, and, and anybody who went and voted in person on, on primary day could see this, 
Um, there's still the, everything, everything spaced out further. Um, fewer people in the polling place at a time. Uh, there are hand sanitizers. Everybody wears a, a face covering, both the poll workers and people coming in and out. Um, and, um, you know, as, as few contact points as possible. So I, I think, you know, I, I think that there's a, there's a basic formula for doing it as safely as it can be done. And um, anybody who's comfortable voting in person on election day, you know, that, that's great. I'm sure the polls, polls will be busy on November 3rd. And I think that both the early voting now going on at City Hall and the mail-in voting options have got, you know, are ensuring that a lot, a lot of people are taking those, uh, taking advantage of those options. And so there, there, hopefully there won't be any one of the methods that gets overused of the three of the early voting, mail-in voting and, and in-person voting on election day. Should we touch on the mail-in for a minute? So let's, let's talk. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask that question. So tell us a little bit about the mail-in voting, which is the third option that, that people have. Right. So, um, so mail-in voting. So if they voting, requested a ballot, they got the ballot by now. So most, most people would have already requested and received their mail-in ballots. Uh, some people are still doing so. Uh, and then when people receive them at home, uh, there are a couple of options for turning them in. You can either put them right back in the mail and send them through the regular U.S. mail, and they'll, they'll come to, to City Hall. Uh, or we've set up three drop boxes around the city. There are three secure ballot drop boxes, um, one at the, in, in, on the outside of City Hall, just off of the back parking lot next to the building. Easy to see. And then there are drop boxes at both the Central Fire Station and the Beverly Farms Fire Station, just outside the, the, the doors that you know, that, that anybody would use going in and out of those buildings, not the bay doors for the trucks, but the, the, the regular entryways. Um, we did not place a ballot box outside of the North Beverly Fire Station because we just couldn't figure out where you could safely park and get out of your car to, to, to drop it off. So there's not one there, but at Beverly Farms and Central, as well as City Hall. The Beverly Farms and Central boxes, we'll be picking them up on a regular basis daily, but the last pickup will be at 3 p.m. on the day before election day. And all this information is also on the website. Um, so if you're gonna drop at one of those boxes before 3 p.m. on Monday, November 2nd, the box outside of City Hall, the last pickup will be at 8 p.m. on election day. So people can actually drop on election day at the City Hall box. You're not supposed to bring those, those mail-in ballots to drop them at the polling place on election day. So your options are, as I said, put them in the mail or bring them to one of the three drop boxes. Okay. Now we are very close to Halloween. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion on uh, the uh, COVID safety protocols for Halloween. So tell us a little bit about the details, uh, what the city is doing and, and how we are, um, we are, uh, uh, being in line with what the state, with the governor is saying about trick-or-treating and meetings and parties. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so we just put out uh, a, a message last Friday about this, spent some time working with other communities, working with the governor's office, trying to make sure, um, you know, that what we do makes sense. Um, so there's no downtown trick-or-treat this year. That's the, the event usually um, sponsored by Beverly Main Streets, and we all love it. But that downtown trick or treat right out in front of City Hall and along Cabot Street where we close the street, there's just not a way to do that with safe distancing. It's, it's, it's one of those events where we just invite everybody to show up. So that's not happening. But neighborhood trick or treating on Halloween on Saturday, October 31st will happen. And it'll be between 5 and 8 p.m. We've put some guidance out and guidance is on our website. It'll be hitting our website in the next day or so. Um, to, to just kind of show best practices. Um, you know, that most of the transmission of the virus comes through respiratory. Um, some of it comes through contact surfaces. So, you know, in looking at both of those things, to trick or treat outdoors, to wear face coverings or face masks, both the kids and their parents, whoever's you know, walking around with them, to stay in small groups that are, you know, essentially family households, um, and, and to stay away from other groups. You know, there's, there's really a lot of common sense at play here. 
And the parents really are, are the ones who are responsible for making sure that it's done safely for each group, them and their kids and their kind of smaller uh, group, whether it be their immediate family or, you know, families take different shapes and sizes, but trying to make sure that we stay in small groups, that the kids are outdoors with masks. And, and for the most part, we think it can be done very safe. Well, we, we're, we're sure it can be done safely. Uh, as far as the, the candy itself, we don't want people, you know, putting candy out in bowls so that the kids reach into bowls that, you know, communally that other kids reach into. It'll be more suggestions that people, they, they, you know, spread candy out on tables and say, okay, take one piece or take a couple pieces. Um, some people are already choosing. I know uh, my niece made for me a, a, a candy shoot out of some PVC piping. So I know, I know some people are looking to, you know, have some fun with those type of, <laughs> of, of ways of, you know, delivering the candy to the kids' bags. Um, but it, it's really, a, really just about being thoughtful. You know, um, I've already said in, in my recommendations, you know, if you can get your kids to get all the candy they're going to get, then put it aside for a couple of days. We know that the virus lives for certain periods of time on different surfaces. But if you leave it aside, then, you know, then you can feel comfortable after a couple of days. I know it's hard yeah. for kids not to want to get home with their candy and just dump it out on the living room floor, sort it into different kinds, kind of count their loot, maybe do some trading. I, I get all yeah. that. So really, yeah. I think it's it's about yeah. being thoughtful about what you touch, not touching your face, um, you know, using washing your hands, whether it be with warm soap and water or hand sanitizer, and, and really just being thoughtful about those things. Um, We've gotten real specific in the guidance that'll be on the website. We'll try to get out to people in various ways, but that's the crux of it. You know, we know that it's safer to do things outdoors. We don't want people having indoor Halloween parties, either for kids or adults. Indoor is, is, is where we have to be far more worried about spread. Um, we don't want large gatherings, again, for the same reason of bringing too many people together, be it indoors or outdoors. You know, if you're in a fairly enclosed outdoor space, even though you're outdoors, if you and I, Walt, were standing a couple of feet apart and chatted for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, we, if one of us had the, had the virus and was, uh, was contagious, it'd be a good chance we'd give it to, to each other, right? So we've got to keep all of that in mind as we try to find a way to, you know, keep something of the familiar for our kids in their Halloween celebration. And that's really the, 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 the whole point of it. We, we believe that we can collectively do it safely outdoors with neighborhood trick-or-treating far better than with large gatherings, parties. We, you know, none, none of that really makes sense right now. Uh, now. Now, Mike, I know that you are very conscientious about using your community phone calls that you make to the community about uh, getting out information on a, on a regular basis. I, I've heard that some people may not... Uh, that, that some people may not get that call. How can they be sure that they are getting that call and what can they do about that, Mike? Right. So a couple of things. Well, first, just so everybody knows, if this weren't, you know, these are very unique times. In a typical year, we probably only use that, that phone call option between 15 and 20 times in a year. It's for snow emergencies and any other type of emergency that might come up and for some regular kind of seasonal or annual events that people want to know about. So in a typical year, you're certainly not going to get bombarded with calls from us. Um, during these times, you know, when, when in the early days of the virus, I think I might have been doing about two calls a week, it's kind of scaled it back to one. Um, I did two calls the other day in one day, but that was pretty, you know, unusual. It was this kind of information we needed to get out about voting, about the holiday coming up. But even now, we're, we're trying to do about one check in a week with, with hopefully helpful information. So anybody who's concerned that, you know, they don't want to give us their information because we'll be harassing them. That's we try to be very thoughtful about using the, the, the tool. Um, and as far as signing up, you can sign up your home phone or your or your uh, mobile phone, your cell phone by calling us directly in my office or by going on the city website. There are a couple of different ways to find the link for, for signing up for these calls. It's, it's, some people call it a reverse 911 phone call system. There's a brand name right. of the product we use. It's called Swift 911. That's what you'll look for. Uh, and we will try to make sure that it, you know, it's prominently on the, on the homepage of the website. 
So we, we've talked a little bit now, we've mentioned the COVID virus uh, several times here during our talk. So let, let's talk about what's happening in Beverly right now. What are, what are our infection rates, et cetera? Et cetera. What, what are the hospitals doing? And what, what kind of recommendations does the city have? Because I know that a lot of people sometimes uh, with this goes on day to day kind of can get a little bit jaded with all the things they have to do. What, what mm -hmm. recommendations do you have, Mike? Sure. So we've been tracking on a daily to weekly basis what's been happening with the virus, obviously, for several months. Um, and in Beverly, we've done really well. Uh, I would say, you know, most people have been have been tremendous about, you know, paying close attention, being thoughtful, um, you know, wearing masks, staying, keeping a distance, avoiding those type of gatherings that, that might, you know, threaten to spread it. Um, so it's been good in that sense. Um, we like no community or no group of people in the history of the world are perfect, right? Uh, but that said, we've seen a, a, a spread, or I should say an incidence in our community of kind of averaging a new case a day for about the last four months. And that's really good. That's kept us down. Um, that's really, it's really prevented any, any significant community spread. We've also benefited from really good outdoor weather um, and I think we need to be, you know, mindful and, and realistic about the fact that it is getting colder, that we are going to be headed for more indoor time. Uh, and, you know, we continue to track, as I said, track the, the number of new positive cases, uh, the number of cases that we have per 100,000 people, you extrapolate that out, given that our own population is about 42,000. We also track with the help of the hospital uh, data on how many people are sick with it, because as we know, Testing with it doesn't mean you're going to get sick with it. Um, not testing positive for it doesn't mean that somebody doesn't get it and carry it because so few people ultimately get tested, right? Um, so the hospital has been showing, again, for the last several months that, you know, anywhere from zero to five or six people at any given time are in Beverly Hospital um, with a positive diagnosis of COVID. Um, Beverly Hospital's uh, COVID count was 62 back in late April during the surge. That, that meant on, on any given day, and certainly the, the days that were at the peak numbers, we had 62 people inpatient at Beverly Hospital positive for COVID. Some in ICU, some not, but all sick enough to be hospitalized, right? So we're, we're have, we have very low, as I said, the other day there was only one person in, but it, you know, it kind of ebbs and flows between one or two up to five or six or seven, we haven't seen any concerning yet spike in those numbers. And we hope to keep those numbers down. Um, look, we all know that a lot of people who get it stay asymptomatic, but that's both good and bad. It means that some people who get it and can transmit it aren't getting sick with it. So we don't, that's why the importance of the measures we take, right? Masking distances, uh, hand washing. Now, you know, one of the things we hear about constantly from all sectors of the country is how it's affected economy, the economy of the country. Can you give us a little bit of idea about how it's affected the local economy here in, uh, in Beverly? Yes. I mean, look, we, we all know that there's a percentage of, of commerce that has done just fine because they've been in, in industries that really there's been a lot of demand to manufacture and uh, and deliver. Um, other parts of our economy have been deemed essential from day one. And so there are workforces who've been right in the front lines. That's brought other concerns because they've been more at risk. Um, but also, you know, there, there are a good number of people who've been working, you know, never had to slow down their work. Good number of businesses that have been able to either with their with their already kind of existing product lines been, been busy. Others have pivoted to manufacturing things they weren't manufacturing that have been needed. Um, so that's good in terms of people's paychecks and, and revenues for the businesses. But then there are a lot of businesses that either had to shut down entirely and some of them have not been able to really reopen. And then those in between that either had to shut down for a period and then reopen, but now that they can't really do the same a percentage of business that they're used to. And so we have a lot of concerns for a lot of our local businesses in those couple of categories. 
And I, I say it out loud and I'm glad you asked about it because we really want to remind people of the importance of supporting in every way we can our local businesses. Um, we've worked real hard with our coffee shops and our restaurants to first make sure that they were able to do takeout business. And now, you know, as we were able to open back up, make as much of their business be outdoor dining as, as possible as the safest way to gather. Um, but, you know, we, we, we've been working with them all along to just try to keep, keep the wheels turning for our businesses. Um, some of them it's, it's, you know, it's about trying to do a percentage of what they're used to and keep, keep the money changing hands and keep their employees, you know, on the job. And, and, and we know that, you know, a lot of people in, in, in that sector of, of our local economy aren't thriving. We want to just keep them moving and keep them surviving because we're all going to come out on the other side of this, right? So we, we certainly hope we all do. Uh, we know that our community will and, and our country will. Um, and and it's, we want our businesses to be in the position to still be standing when we get to the other side of, of, of this. And there's a, you know, there's a reliable vaccine and there's, there are, you know, improved as we go treatments. So a lot of this is just trying to keep our businesses standing. So anybody who can buy gift certificates, anybody who can get takeout, anybody who, you know, depending on your own ability financially, depending on your own comfort level, uh, you know, to go and, and, and patronize safely, obviously, is, is the key, but our local businesses in every way we can to keep them moving. Now, we're working with our, our you know, partners at the state level and at the federal level to try to make sure that the, the financial resources keep coming. Uh, there was some, you know, some good resources initially from the federal government to a lot of companies and employees. Um, you know, we've tried to do our part. There's a, 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 a modest, but, you know, it's, it's real money. It's just not enough uh, program through state CDBG funds that the city is offering to small businesses, businesses with five or fewer full-time employees that can try to get some, some help to tide them through. Uh, they're modest amounts, but it's, it's worth looking at. Anybody who has a question about that should, should reach out to my office. Um, there's a lot there, Walt. I don't want to just ramble, but I think maybe the overall message is our small businesses matter to all of us. Anyone who has the wherewithal to, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to patronize those businesses, please do, because we want them all to be here when the, when the, um, when the, the pandemic is, is under control and we're out the other side of it. Well, that's good information. We're, we're uh, almost out of time, but let me ask you one final question, Mike. Sure. The, the city has just hired a sustainability director. Mm -hmm. And so what, why do we need a sustainability director? What are the functions and expectations of that position, Mike? Sure. Yeah. So first, I'll just say this is a full-time professional position. And, and we had initially looked to try to um, uh, propose this in the FY 2021 budget for this year. But when COVID hit, you know, it, it seemed clear that it wasn't really the, the, the right time to try to push uh, adding a position to our budget in, in such a difficult time for people to pay their taxes and whatnot. So we, you know, we have this climate action planning process underway. We're together with our partners in, in the city of Salem, where we're planning for how to address the impacts of climate change, coastal flooding, um, um, kind of the, the, uh, the, the volatility of weather and storm events and, and heat concerns. Um, so we, we, we're trying to focus on the planning of that and of how we drive down our greenhouse gas emissions. Because the main way in which we as a city government, in which any resident or business of the city generates greenhouse gas emissions is through our buildings and our transportation system. So however people get around and the electricity, heating and cooling in their homes and their, their offices and all that, those are the ways in which we need to find ways to, to transition to renewable energy so that we don't continue to, you know, to, to uh, promote, to, to kind of worsen the, the impacts on climate. Um, so we thought, let's, let's focus on the plan. And, and when the plan's done and we're past the other side of the, of the virus, hopefully we'll be in a position to hire the, the person. But then somebody called me and said they wanted to fund the position for us. So we, we looked into that. We had to make sure that this was real and, and genuine. And it turns out it, it is, it was, and it is. Um, an individual, you know, with a with a, a charitable mindset, um, 
has made a donation to the city of $100,000 for this fiscal year to cover 80% of the cost of the position and, 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 and related expenses. Now, we may not spend that whole 100,000 because it's, it's meant to cover 80%. We've hired somebody, there's a salary uh, cost. We've hired the person at $85,000 a year. Um, the person is either going to take a, an individual or a family health care plan, depending on their situation. And then there, there's the cost of dues to a, a national sustainability director um, network that we already belong to, but now it's appropriate to take from this fund. Um, and then the professional development and conference kind of work that in normal times, um, people would go and, and in person do the type of networking and sharing of, of important information. Some of that this year is happening in a more remote way. But point being, 80% of the overall costs of that work are being covered in this, this, in this year, in year one, by the, uh, by the donor. And then in year two, they'll cover 60% of the overall costs. And in year three, they'll cover 40%. It's a really thoughtful way to minimize any impact on, on the city um, to support the, the work. And then the city will, over a period of time, will, will own the position. Um, but the work's incredibly important because we're, we're working on so many different fronts to try to transition our vehicle fleet, to try to create, host, benefit from clean and renewable energy options on city property, to try to work with the, the broader community on, on opportunities for homeowners and business owners. Uh, and there, there are a number of sustainability initiatives like the new police station that we're trying to make as, as close to 100% clean and renewable as we can. We're already building a geothermal system for the heating and cooling of the building. And we're going to host uh, solar panels on the rooftop and as a canopy over the parking lot. Um, that's an example of work that the sustainability director will now be the project manager on that procurement and, and, and um, installation of the solar. Um, we're, we've undertaken a community choice aggregation effort which will be, that'll be going public with a lot of, a lot of public um, engagement in the coming months, which is a way for communities to try to, in an ag by, by way of aggregating an energy purchase, an electricity purchase, um, providing lower cost to all of our residents, all of our ratepayers, residents and business owners. And at the same time, uh, try to leverage that buying power to make sure that more of that electricity is clean and renewable electricity and isn't generated by fossil fuels. So this, this person will now be the project manager for so many of these different projects, which has really landed on my desk a lot, on the city engineer, the city planner, the grant director, the commissioner of public services, the chief of staff. There are any number of people who end up having to touch this work. And now to have somebody who can really oversee it, management and, and manage it and drive it forward is gonna be a great thing for our community. Well, we, we are out of time, Your Honor. Thank you. That, that's very good information. And uh, I'd like to remind our viewers that you have been watching City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.